Welcome to the 12 Days of Healing, and this is day number three. I'm sharing this with my patrons for all 12 paintings, but I think I'm going to share this one on Monet Cafe as well, just so you can see what we're doing over on my Patreon page. I'm also loving how we are sharing our completed paintings all together as a group in the Google album that uh, I started just for this exercise. And as my patrons know, this 12 days of consecutive painting is an effort to bring healing to our hearts and souls during this trying time in our world. So join me on this third lesson. Now, it's appropriate. Day three, three pairs. And also, I have said that I will do a different technique or try to do something different on each painting so that you guys can learn more. And in this case, I decided to do a watercolor underpainting. This is actually a separate watercolor I did of the same subject matter prior to the watercolor underpainting. But join me in this lesson where I describe how to use this wonderful technique. Hello, patrons. Today, I'm getting started on session number three of our 12 Days of Healing. Today is March 28th. And so in this little five by five square on the UART sanded paper, I'm going to be creating a painting of some pears. I found this lovely little photo, reference photo on Paint My Photo of some pears. And uh, I will provide the link to the image in the Patreon post, so you can use that if you like, or you can come up with your own uh, idea or composition, just trying to stay with the same theme. Now, I wanted to show you the supplies, but I also want to share with you that I went ahead and did a little watercolor uh, uh, painting because I'm going to be doing a watercolor underpainting uh, for today's painting session. Now, I, you know, I love watercolor. I know I'm always painting in pastels, but I've really come to, to love watercolor. And it's, a, it's really a great way to learn more about color. And uh, it's also a great way to do an underpainting for pastels. So that's what we're gonna be doing today. And I don't need to apply any clear gesso in this case, like I often do when I'm working on watercolor uh, paper because UART paper is already sanded and it takes water. So I should be able to, or I will be able to, do a little watercolor painting right here on the sanded surface and then just go ahead and start applying the pastels. So here are my supplies. Uh, of course, we're gonna use pastels after we do the watercolor painting. The reference photo had, of course, those lovely uh, colors that are found in pairs. These are happen to be green, but they also have a lot of uh, yellowy orange, tints to them in places as well. There's a lot of shadows in this photo as well, underneath the pears, uh, in the background, on the tabletop or whatever it is they're on. And I just saw a hint of pink in the, it's not really the sky, it's almost like it's a window, but I'm gonna keep it a little bit abstract. Now also I'm gonna need something darker for stems. I gotta check these, but these are new pastels. Um, I know this one's a little dark, it's almost a blue, but um, something a little harder to make those stems look a little more prominent. But in general, I've just got some oranges and red colors, some greens and yellows that are kind of bright, uh, not too dark in value. The blues um, leading down to this darker, almost like a purplish blue. This is my darkest dark right here. It's kind of a purple. And uh, of course, these, these are a little more, this one especially is more toned down. These are kind of neutral here. And uh, you don't want, or I don't want everything so punchy and I want the pears to really stand out. So I didn't want the tabletop to compete with that with too many bright colors. And again, the pink. So that's the general uh, pastel color palette for this painting. Now, because I'm doing a watercolor underpainting, I've really been enjoying, this is the set that I just used for that pear watercolor painting. I've been enjoying this uh, Arteza set. Again, I mentioned they, they're so nice to send me free art supplies if I use them in my videos. And I've really come to love this little 36 piece Arteza watercolor set. I like that these, uh, these little pans of watercolor are removable, but I happen to really like the colors that came with this set. It also comes with this nice little uh, water pen. Um, water goes in the back, so if you're traveling, you know, you can, uh, uh, these work really well too. That's got a really nice fine point, but if you're traveling and you don't have access to water, you can fill up water in your pen and uh, use your watercolor brush like that. So anyway, that's a nice little, uh, nice little travel set. Also too, it has this little holder on the bottom to kind of hold it like a palette. And also you'll need some water, of course, um, some paper towels and some brushes. I'm also using a really light pencil here that um, I will use to kind of sketch in 
the pears before I do them with watercolor. So, and you know, with uh, when you're doing an underpainting with watercolor and you're gonna put pastel on top, you don't even need very expensive brushes. I have some expensive brushes, but these are just some little brushes from um, Walmart. And uh, often I'll try to use the biggest brushes I can for the subject matter I'm working on because that lends towards more impressionism. All right, so it's time to get started with this lovely little reference photo of some pears and starting with a watercolor underpainting. Here we go. I also want to mention that for this Monet Cafe version of the YouTube video, I'll only have a small thumbnail of the reference image next to the painting, but my patrons will have the image as an attachment so you can use it as you paint. So if you'd like to become a patron, there's the link above. Only $5 a month. You can cancel at any time. First, I'm going to get started with just sketching in the basic um, shapes of these pairs. And I do recommend, I mean, if you have time, and a lot of us have more time now because we're uh, quarantined in our homes, if you have more time than you normally do, um, to go ahead and um, do the watercolor, you know, just a quick little watercolor study before you even commit to the um, UART paper or whatever surface you're working on. Again, I'm doing little five by fives, so um, they, uh, I have to sometimes kind of change the composition a little bit um, based on what the reference photo is, but you can choose whatever size you want. Now I've got my, um, call it a horizon line or a table line or whatever. I see that um, it is up in the upper third. And I also, um, I talk a lot about negative painting and I did recently provide a negative painting video um, on kind of how to see negative shapes and uh, it really helps you in your drawing. Like for example, I'm looking at the shapes of these pairs. I'm looking not just at the, I'm actually looking right now from my watercolor painting instead of the reference image that you'll be seeing because uh, I kind of like the way I had laid that out. So I'm working from that, but I'm looking at the, the net, not just the shape and the size of this pair, which is basically a circle, this one. I'm looking at this negative shape in here. How close is it to the edge? How far does it come down here? Um, and then I also, as I start to draw the other ones, I also um, start to look at the negative spaces between the pair. So this one's basically a little circle. And again, here's a little negative shape in here. And I see this little V in this little area that helps me to see kind of where to draw this pair. And this one's kind of coming, then there's a, they're not quite touching. One thing you don't want to do in art is, you don't want them, you either want them to overlap or not touch. You don't want them just barely touching. Okay, that's just really not a great composition. Um, and I see, I didn't want them on the same equal plane. Um, so I realized I wanted this one kind of coming up a little higher. I think it is in the photo. Again, I'm not looking at the photo right now, but I see, I don't know where that line came from, but I see how this pair kind of has a shape that kind of comes up. It comes over if I divided my paper in half here, the edge of the pair comes over almost um, almost to a third if I had divided it into thirds, okay? The, it comes over like right in here somewhere. I might make it a little bigger. And then I look at the negative shape of this pair um, with this edge here too of where it's meeting. Again, it might not, I'm not looking at the reference photo. I'm looking at my um, watercolor that I already did, so I'm not sure if all the shapes and spaces will be the same. So we've got a little gestural quality to that pair, and um, uh, I know his little stem's going to be coming up. I like how they uh, have little, in other words, don't make a stem straight up. They have like a little nice gestural quality to that. I'll kind of enhance that as I work. All right, so we've got kind of that nice shape of that pair. I'll work on this one again in a minute. Now I'm going to look again at the negative spacing here. I'm gonna see kind of how close does it come? Well, it comes right about that close. Again, not touching, this one's in the foreground. Also, I'm looking at how far does this pair come over, okay? And in my watercolor, it comes over about there. How far does it come up? It comes up a little bit from the bottom of the paper, not a lot. And that kind of helps you to get a general idea instead of just uh, drawing um, blindly, you know? And I can kind of re reshape some of these. Okay, and I, I, again, I see the, I think I wanna bring this down a little more here. Some of this will kind of change a little bit as um, 
as I'm sketching or painting. And I see where does this end of this come? It comes actually almost a little bit back here. And then it kind of curves in here. It looks very flat right now, of course, because it's just a drawing. But when you start adding the shadows and things, um, that really is going to help a lot. Okay, so we've got this, and now we've got another real um, gestural or kind of exciting little wing to the stem there. Now we can see in this one, this pair, because it's facing forward, it's kind of um, got a circle in a circle. That little section that, that um, curves in and makes the smaller top or smaller part is facing us. So we're not going to draw the circle or paint it, you know, so um, vividly like this. But um, it does help to kind of get that idea of where it is. Now, the stem of this isn't quite in the center. It's a little bit higher than the center. So we're going to have a little dark space there. And again, I really liked how these stems were. This one, it doesn't come up and over the, uh, yeah, it does. A little bit comes up and over the um, tabletop again, kind of in my, my drawing. All right, so we've got some three little basic pear shapes here. We've got a general composition. Um, I don't worry about the pencil marks uh, because I know I'm gonna be adding pastel over this. Notice though that I didn't use charcoal. A lot of times I'll use a charcoal pencil or a, a harder pastel, but I really didn't want that to interfere with my watercolor. Uh, I wanted to keep it a little cleaner, so that's why I used the pencil. All right, so now I'm gonna get started with the watercolor and I am going to use First, I'm gonna use this bigger brush. Once again, I like to use the biggest brush that I can because it keeps you from getting fussy and also it makes broader, smoother strokes. If I used, uh, this is gonna be a real big exaggeration, but if I use this brush, first of all, it's gonna take longer and it's gonna make little lines and oh, you know, it's just gonna to look too fussy. So a big broad brush is a good way to do it. Now I'm gonna do a little bit of a wash um, on this. And again, this UART paper is awesome because it takes water really nicely um, and it behaves kind of like watercolor paper because it doesn't soak in like watercolor paper, but um, you still get a similar effect. I had a little bit too much water on my brush, um, but I'm not gonna worry so much about getting um, everything just so. And with this to me, it's okay. I'm doing basically just wetting the um, background area here above the tabletop. I'm not dipping my brush very good, obviously. But um, see that charcoal? That's where I said I made a charcoal border and um, that uh, blends into this, so I'm gonna try to avoid that. Um, but anyway, I, I'm not gonna care that much if this dripped a little bit down the tabletop or whatever, because I kind of like that impressionistic um, look and it's okay if things kind of blend and bleed together. So for right now, but to keep things simple, <laughs> I'm gonna work just on this area to kind of help you out with um, maybe um, the color choices that I'm using. The background here, I'm not gonna try to recreate exactly, just like in the watercolor paper or painting, uh, exactly what's in the photo. Um, it was like it was a background window, light was coming and going, and um, I'm just gonna kind of really impressionistically uh, get that in. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna pick some of these blues the ones that I chose, I'll try to hold it up so you can see here, were, um, I think it was a combination of blues. This is almost like a cobalt blue here, but it wasn't quite that bright. It had a little bit more of, I think it might've been this blue here. Okay, you see how that um, made it just a little bit darker? So I'm gonna add a little bit of that in this background sky and um, or window or whatever it is. And I'm just gonna let it go, and let it drip. And if it gets too runny uh, and you have too much water on it, you kind of blot your brush off before you apply it. I'm just gonna let these little drips and things happen. I don't really even care. I think I wanna get a little more color. Watercolor dries lighter so sometimes it's okay if you get it on a little more dark than um, you originally think it should be because it's just going to really dry up. A little bit more of this in here. And uh, I like how when you do a wet on wet technique like I just did because I wet the paper first, 
often I used to get so fussy about uh, where certain colors were and making them uh, blend just right. They kind of blend themselves as they dry. So that's really all you need to do for that. Now, this tabletop um, was a little bit of a deeper blue. It didn't have as much of the teal in it. So I'm going to mix something up. I think I used for that a combination of, I don't know if you can see these colors. It was this color over here. And so I got to kind of go from memory here. It's this uh, blue here, almost like a Prussian blue. And this is kind of like an indigo. I may add just a little bit of this like cobalt blue in there to kind of lighten it up just a bit. See, it's kind of a grayed down blue there. So let's do some of that. And gradually this uh, tabletop is going to get darker as you move forward. Now, I didn't wet this part here, I just realized. So I'm gonna get a uh, another brush really quickly. This is going to be, oh, I have one here already actually. I have this brush here. I would normally like it to be a little bit larger, but it's just what I have here. I'm gonna take this again. I don't care if that color drips into this color, it's just fine. And I'm going to wet just this area right here for now. When I dry my brush out again, or rinse it out again, I will um, put more water at the bottom of the UART paper. So right now I'm just using water and I'm just kind of, notice the tabletop in between the pairs and at the upper part is lighter than the lower parts. Even uh, other than the shadows under the pairs, even areas like right in here is lighter. It's like the light from behind here is kind of peeking through and then it gradually gets a little darker under here. But that should work for now because, oh, maybe a little more right here, because I just want to get this top part of the table right now, and then I'll add water to the bottom. I really do like watercolor. I like applying pastel on top of watercolor. Um, often, you know, you may have seen videos, you can do it right on watercolor paper. It's kind of an inexpensive way to combine watercolor and pastels. And then you can do clear gesso. Um, you apply it after the watercolor dries. Um, you apply the clear gesso. It adds a little grit to it. And then um, you have a little bit of a sanded surface to work on. So see, I'm just kind of letting this uh, water, again, this is just an underpainting. It's not like we're trying to create a, a fancy watercolor painting. I'm letting it just kind of run, do its watercolor thing. I love just that characteristic of watercolor. I actually, I've decided, I hope I can do this, find time to do this, is because so many people are home right now, and there's a lot of people who, um, I mean, you you artists are really blessed because you we, we really don't have a problem staying home <laughs> most of the time if we can find the time to paint because we've got something we can do. We have a craft or a hobby or whatever you wanna call it, an artistic skill. And a lot of people don't have that. So because of that, um, I thought a lot of people don't have pastels. They, you know, they just don't have the supplies. So I thought watercolor is really simple. Sometimes, even if stores are closed or whatever, people, especially if they have kids, they'll have the little basic kids watercolor little palette set, you know, the ones that you find uh, or that you have like in kindergarten or whatever. And so I thought I would do some real simplified watercolor tutorials showing about color mixing, uh, the ways watercolor behaves on watercolor paper, the techniques, and then at the very end, um, do a, a little very simple painting. Um, maybe you um, artists could give me your input on that. If you think that people, you know, maybe people who don't have the time in their lives to even try art, that that might be something that, that they would like, might be something you would like. I mean, sometimes pastel artists, you haven't worked with watercolor a lot. And, um, you know, you might want to learn a little bit more about the techniques. So let me know what you think about that. Now I'm going a little darker with the bottom of the table. Again, a lot of pastel is going to cover this up, but hey, I'm having fun with this too. So let me add some of these colors in here. And I already applied the clean water to this. So now I'm just adding this darker color, adding a little bit more of a kind of a brighter blue in here to this tabletop down here. And a lot of times when I do um, like how I'm working around the pairs, often it's better to kind of geometrically square things off with edges rather than curvy lines. It, it gives it a little bit more of a, 
artistic graphic feel um, when you do that. This part of the table was pretty dark. So I'm gonna get this in here. Just see how that blends so nicely, isn't that nice? And the wet on wet really helps it to, to blend nicely. Now there is one thing about watercolor you wanna realize is the timing of when you apply um, the watercolor to the paper is important. Um, right now is a really good safe time to apply it because uh, the paper's wet, it's freshly wet, but there's a point where the paper gets almost dry. And then if you were to go back, I'm just adding a little bit of an idea of some shadows here. If you were to go back and um, put some watercolor, uh, your brush that's kind of wet uh, down on the paper, it creates something called blooms that, I mean, unless you're purposely trying to do that, it's usually something you don't want. I mean, you want the surface to stay kind of smooth. So don't wait too long if you're still working on something, in other words, to, um, to add things. See, see, this is still wet, so whatever I add is gonna blend right in, but if I wait too long, I'm gonna get one of those blooms, and that's what I don't want. So why, on that note, <laughs> while it's still wet, I'm gonna start adding some of these shadows underneath. Um, this is a little thicker paint. I don't have quite as much water in this, so because I don't want it to get all runny everywhere. So I'm just adding some of these shadows. Again, a lot of this is gonna get covered up with um, pastel. But maybe not. Sometimes I add a limited amount of pastel when I do this. Got a little into that, but that's okay. Um, and watercolor is pretty forgiving. If you rinse your brush out, um, you can just kind of you know work things out and make it work for part of a shadow in it. Again, it just adds to impressionism. All right, a little bit more. This is a little shadow under here. I didn't get enough of that dark. A little shadow under the sky here. I think I got the paper pretty wet. That's why it's um, it's not coming out very dark there, but I added extra paint. Again, embrace the drips, it's okay. This one comes down a little lower here, and then it gradually blends kind of in with the darkness that's going on down here at the bottom. You're kind of, in a way, creating a value study um, with your uh, underpainting, which is usually a good idea. That's a great way to begin a painting is with a value study. Again, I'm not looking at the reference photo, so hopefully I'm getting these uh, little shadowy arrows, areas right. I know that this the bottom of this table is just dark, period. All right, because I got this little one darker. Let's go ahead and get this one a little darker. Okay, and now we can let this dry and um, start working on uh, kind of giving the pears some value and some color. So I'm gonna let this dry and then we'll get started. Okay, so this is pretty much dry enough uh, I don't think I'm gonna do a wet on wet for the pears. In other words, apply water before I apply it. Um, because again, this is just an underpainting and I don't need to get um, too fussy about it. I do know that there are some shadows in these pears. So I'm gonna go ahead and add those shadows with kind of that, that cooler blue that I had used that was in the sky here. And um, uh, let's see. So again, I'm working from my um, my painting and not the reference image, but um, I do see that there were some shadows in here, just in this little part right here. Obviously the sun is coming from this way because you can see the highlights on the pears. Um, there were some shadows in here, kind of wrapped around. I cut this pear off a little bit, but I'll fix that with pastels. Coming down around here, some in here. Actually, this whole bottom is pretty much shadowed, so it's a little highlight there somewhere. Okay, let's get more shadows on this guy here. This bottom part, I'm going to, again, round this guy out. We have flexibility um, as we work. We don't have to um, get so fussy about everything being just right. Obviously, there's going to be a shadow here because it's kind of on the shadowy side. <laughs> wraps around a little bit more and let's get some more shadows on this guy uh, this one down at the bottom is obviously a little more shadowy so I'm even going to add a little bit of that 
uh, richer blue to it. So again, these uh, watercolor underpaintings, it's kind of a little road map. And as I start to add the pastel, I'll talk a little bit more about um, the differences between pastel and watercolor and sometimes the advantages that watercolor has over pastel. Um, there are some beautiful, wonderful advantages of watercolor. And if you can learn to combine the two in a way that accentuates their own beauty, then you've done a great job of doing a mixed media type of painting. All right, so let's see if I go in that too much. I'm gonna get one of those blooms I talked about <laughs> before. All right, so now, um, because the whole pair isn't so wet, I can, I'm just gonna go ahead and combine some of those greens in there um, and yellowy colors. What I did, I believe when I did the watercolor before, is I used this um, kind of a bright, almost lemony yellow and combined it a little bit with this brightest green that I have. I had more yellow than green though when I mixed it up. So let's do that. And I could have just done kind of a value study with the pears and then applied all my greens and everything on top with the pastel, but I thought this might be fun for some of you guys um, to just go ahead and play and learn a little bit about watercolor. I'm noticing my water is getting a little dirty too. And if I was focused more on this just being a watercolor painting, I'd probably go clean my water to keep the colors as fresh as possible. I probably should look back at the reference image too. I noticed there were some interesting little places where there were highlights. I think it was here where the tabletop, maybe it was this one, was um, something was reflecting back up on the pair. I'll definitely look at the reference photo when I go back and do the the pastel painting. Okay, here's where I was saying, I want more yellow, where I was saying I could uh, reintroduce that pair a little bit. And that's one of the things, you know, a lot of people want to know about impressionistic approaches, and that's definitely a way to do it is by having soft edges or lost edges, it's often called, because um, when your edges are stark and well-defined, <clears throat> that um, just takes away from that artistic painterly feel. Uh, this up here was the brightest part of this pair. At least that's how it is in my watercolor painting. And um, the, I'm going to add a little bit more orangey. Now that does have, even though I used a lemony yellow just now, I'm going to start introducing some more orangey yellows because it definitely had those colors as well. Let me see which color. Oh, here's one that's even more orangey. For example, like this little ochre kind of color. And also down here, this is definitely more of an orangey. I'm hoping my camera is showing these. Um, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give it some of these orangey colors now and just kind of uh, dollop them on in places. And notice I'm using this big brush for this whole time. I haven't gone to some teeny brush. And uh, it really helps me to keep that painterly look with the big brush instead of a, oh I didn't even add any of the green back there um this definitely had some more orangey color on this side of this pair and uh, down in here go grab some more of this and I'm blending it right over the blue uh the blue shadow which is fine let's get I'm, I'm gonna go ahead and get that green yellowy green in here first uh, okay so more yellow than green this is that bright lemony yellow um, because it's up closer to uh, where the source of light is. I'm just using this to kind of um, blend those together a little bit more. Getting a little bit of that bloom effect there because that one was kind of drying just to point it out so you understand what I'm saying. Now for down here, um, because it's more in the shadow, I'm choosing, uh, instead of this brighter orangey color, I'm gonna go with something a little uh, duller and darker in value because it is more in the shadow. I'm actually gonna add a little of that blue to it too. You can pick up on your watercolor palette other colors that are kind of sitting there from before and make more like a dulled down 
uh, more of a grayish uh, rusty color. And again, this part should be fine to add because it didn't have any um, color on it or uh, water on it before. Often I move the, uh, uh, place the brush and move the brush um, to conform to the pair. In other words, if you were, think of it as rubbing your hand across something. Like if I was rubbing my hand across this pair, it would kind of go up right there. So um, I'm gonna add a little bit of a richer green to that, maybe with like a little blue in it. Look right in here. Oh, I got too much water. See, there's a bloom. That's exactly what it looks like. It looks like, they call it that because it looks like a little flower. And it's because I had too much um, water on my brush. So I'm about done with um, just getting some of the colors I want in these pairs. But I could really just have fun doing a watercolor painting again. <laughs> it is definitely a lot of fun. Add a little bit more blue down here to the sky because uh, he's in the shadow. All right, so we've got a little idea of a watercolor underpainting, and uh, we can start with pastel. Uh, I might, I don't mind that really bad, but or too much, but I think I'm gonna go ahead and get a little bit more around the edges of this pair a little bit. Lose that white. Just soften it up a little bit there. All right, so now I can go ahead and start adding um, pastel to this once it dries and uh, tell you a little bit more about how to do that. And once again, I don't have to apply anything else. No clear gesso in this painting because we're working on UART paper. Um, another paper you can do this with, I can't remember if I've actually done this yet or not. Someone told me pastel matte works great for doing a watercolor underpainting as well. And of course you can use watercolor paper, but again, you've got to put something down to give it a grit. And, um, but I, UART paper is so great. It's so versatile and um, great for multiple ways of underpainting. All right, so let me let this dry and we'll be back for pastel application. All right, it's uh, pretty much dry. This part's not quite as dry, but it should be. I'm gonna work a little at the top now. One disadvantage about, well, especially how I have all of my um, sections sectioned off for the painting is that um, when you add water to UART paper, it can buckle a little bit and warp. And I can't really uh, fix that right now. Normally I would kind of take the tape off and kind of flatten it out, but kind of stuck with that right now, but that's okay. I will work around it. All right, so now it's time to start applying the pastel, and I'm going to try to describe to you um, one of the, maybe you could call it a challenge of working with watercolor and pastel, is that uh, I mentioned I would describe the qualities um, of each that is advantageous, and the quality of watercolor that I love so much is its luminosity. It is by nature a luminous medium because it's transparent for the most part. There are some watercolor colors that are more opaque than others, but it's a transparent medium. And pastel, on the other hand, is an opaque medium. In other words, uh, you're not gonna see a lot of the paper showing through when you apply pastel, whereas you see a lot of the brightness of the paper when you apply watercolor. So what naturally happens when you apply pastel um, to watercolor is that you're gonna, it, it appears so much darker because of its uh, opaqueness, because it's not translucent. So that's just something you kind of have to deal with. And sometimes I try to be very sparing with my pastel application. And sometimes I end up covering the majority of the watercolor painting up. It, it was just, like I said, kind of as a, a roadmap. So I'm gonna play around with that one right now. I'm gonna get my darkest values in first to work with. I know when I add, um, something to this. Let's add, um, this is one of the, I probably need some more lighter colors. This is one of the, let's say this color is kind of similar to this background color here. Um, so let me, um, I've been putting my little uh, paper over here. Let me get up and see if you can see that in this filming. 
yeah, you can see the edge. So um, this is uh, this particular, it's kind of a pale prim, uh, periwinkle color. Um, so you see that it's in the same color family as this, but let me apply it right next to here. And if I put this on top of this, I don't know if you can see that, it already appears so much darker because it's not translucent. The paper isn't showing through when I add this. So you know what, on that note, before I get started, I'm gonna grab a few other lighter colors really quickly. All right, these are some of the lightest um, pastels that I have in my pastel palette. I know it's hard to tell, but this one has more pink to it. Maybe, maybe you can tell on the film. It definitely has a pink, bright hue to it. Uh, this one has a little more blue to it. Mike can tell that. A little, little more grayed down. And this one, a little bit, I know I'm working around that dark one. You can see how dark that is now compared to these light ones. Oh, this one has even more blue in it, you can kind of see. So that bright pink one is my brightest one. I could choose one that has a little more yellow in it too. So with that in mind, um, let me show you how these apply on top of this. I think I will try one of these colors here. I'm gonna put this one down first, the one I originally applied, because it is it does have some darkness to it. This is a pastel I broke. It's a Terry Ludwig that I broke. And um, it, uh, it that's why it looks a little special. <laughs> Bless its heart. So I'm just coming in here and giving some strokes of this more of a lavendery blue down through this uh, on top, and I'm going really, really soft. Now I'm gonna come back with this one that was more gray down. Let's see, is it that one? Check the other one. It's this one. And I'm going to just glaze this one because we've got some light kind of shining through, coming down on these pairs. I might have to darken that up a little bit more, add a little more layers. Of, um, that's where that warping is right there. It won't let me get that little area, but that's all right. Well, it'll add to the impressionistic feel. And I'm keeping a super light touch right now. You know what, I think I might even, I know this is gonna be really dark, but I'm going to add just a little bit of this one. It has a little bit more of that kind of pink color in it. You see how the pastels start kind of blending themselves a little bit? So often you don't even have to do the old standard um, pipe foam insulation blending that we sometimes do. And then if it gets a little dark, I don't lose where my stem is. If it gets a little dark in areas, we can just come back with that light and glaze over it again. Again, super light touch. This background is not what I want to be all that noticeable. So we don't have to do very much to it. But when you set your values, it it affects, or when you add a value or establish a value, it affects everything else in the painting. You have to make sure your values relate to each other correctly. Um, so that's often why we go ahead and we add what we consider to be our darkest dark and our lightest light. Now this is that dark, again, buckly paper. I may have to do some blending with this just because the paper is so darn buckly. Maybe I can press it down a little bit. That's a pain, but whatever. We're supposed to be relaxing, right? Relax and enjoy this process. Yeah, it's, see, it's not even letting me um, get a smooth application of this. So I am go going to resort to doing some blending down here. Okay, that's that one. Now I've got this other purpley color that I can add in here. Maybe just by doing some fractured strokes, it will um, make up for the warped paper. See how that already helps it a little bit? I like this purple color, wow. 
So that's this is my darkest dark. I'm going to put a little bit more of this purple up here underneath some of these shadows. Or the pairs for the shadow. And this one does come down a little bit here, but I'm going to I'm going to blend over top of this. We typically put our darkest darks down first with pastel because you can blend lights on top of it. I've got a shadow coming down here. Again, I'm kind of looking at negative shapes. I'm looking at those little negative shapes in between the pairs as much as the shapes of the pairs themselves. All right, maybe I won't have to blend too much with that. All right, so now what I wanted to do is get more of a little bit of a lighter value. I've got this purple that's a little bit lighter in value than this purple. So get a good edge to that. So I'm gonna use that to kind of soften some of these edges and to start adding some um, lighter values and then I'll, I'll glaze over that with an even lighter value. And I guess um, probably the best way to describe this is this is like the blocking in stage where you're working on the biggest shapes. You don't really need to get overly crazy about um, getting things too perfect. Now, this is that one that I used in the sky. And even though I kind of like this, um, I, I, I might use this in combination. No, actually, is this? No, this is darker value. So I'm going to use some of this and... Um, to lighten it up, this color that I used in the sky. Okay, that was deceiving. It looked kind of like the sky color. I'm trying to find kind of a good edge because, again, I'm dealing with this buckling here. And I'm, you know what, I'm going to brighten it up a little bit with some brighter blue, but this kind of gets it going here. I'm gradually, you'll probably notice, I'm gradually getting lighter in value as I'm getting higher up. This seems to have some of that almost pink shining through, again, from the window or whatever it is back there. Some sort of light source. Oh, there's that little bump there. Okay, and I'm gonna go a little higher. Really light touch here. And then I'll use a lighter pastel and you may notice I mean sometimes you see like the whole it's like she's holding that pastel on its side why isn't the why isn't it going right over the pears it's because you learn to turn your pastel um, like I'm turning it kind of on the corner here right now to kind of work in between that I really didn't want this edge of this pear remember I talked about edges joining I didn't want it to join that top of the table so I've got to make a decision, either put the tabletop underneath it or over top of it. And I'm going to put it over top. I think that's how it is in the reference image. Again, I keep forgetting to even look at the reference image because I've done it um, once already and I have my watercolor painting next to it. All right, we've got a little bit of a, can you see how loose that is? Nothing's really crazy or set in stone. Now this is a blue that I really like and I thought it would add some pizzazz to this. So I'm just going to kind of, um, again, you can call this maybe a fractured type of application. Fractured is where you put one color next to another color of the same value. You're not really um, pressing hard or covering it up. Um, usually they're, they're juxtaposed to each other and they create this illusion sometimes of another color, which is neat. Uh, you could also call this scumbling. I'm kind of more scumbling right now, which it's kind of just making little little marks of color next to each other. And um, they they vibrate together and kind of make interesting visual, a visual play on, with the eyes. For the eyes, I should say. And I'm trying to keep, even the tabletop, I want to keep that that soft edge, I don't want it to be so prominent. And I may even lighten that up a little more in value. 
It's a little slanted, <laughs> but I can fix that. Got this little bit of a lighter lavender that I'm gonna use here. Oh, I'm sorry, I'm forgetting to put um, marks here. But this has a little bit more pink in it. Again, we've got the warmth of the sun. So, or where, again, whatever that light source is, kind of shining down. And um, it's uh, lavender, this lavender anyway, has more yellow in it, believe it or not. Um, that's what gives it more of a pink look and a blue look to the lavender color. Some of that is coming down kind of in here. And it's okay to make kind of directional linear strokes. This might even be a Rembrandt. You know, I know a lot of artists don't talk about Rembrandt much or use it much, but they have their place just like new pastels do. Rembrandts are a little bit harder um, than, uh, than, I'm sorry, they're a little harder than regular soft pastels, but they're not quite as hard as new pastels. But um, they're great for making linear strokes. Another pastel that is a harder pastel that uh, I like a lot is um, Giro, and uh, it's a French pastel. And you know, I got I haven't broken out my Giro's in a while. <laughs> I need to do that. Uh, okay, I think I might want to add a little bit more of this purple in here to darken this up just a little bit around this pair, and then I can start kind of working on pear shapes. All right, so we've got basically, you might wanna add a little bit more of this color down here. We've got basically a little bit of a underpainting value study going on um, here. I kinda like um, how this dark has a, uh, a warmth to it. It's kind of giving a little bit of interest to this dark that I have. Might add just a tad of that underneath some of these, just right where the most or the darkest value would be under these pairs. A little bit, try not to create too much of an edge. I can blend it more uh, later with another value if I want. But that's definitely where the darkest values are in this um, reference images, under the pairs and uh, down at the bottom part. Yeah, I'm gonna soften these up. So you can put your dark value down and then you can kind of soften them with the next value up. Like see, this is the value that I was using in here. And I can just kind of glaze over, to, not too much, just over some of the edges there and kind of soften it so it doesn't look quite, I'm using a really light touch, so it doesn't look quite so stark. Really light touch here, softly, softly. Blending that in. All right, and that's giving a little bit of that um, solidity. Um, it's a. It's got more of a solid three-dimensional feel because of that. I've got this is a. Um, this is a really dark blue, and I feel like this one down here. It's um, because it's down in the shadows, and it's a little cooler down here in color temperature. It could stand to have a little bit more of a dark shadow down here. Now, uh, again, I probably should look at the reference photo, but if I know where the sun is, you can kind of get an idea of where the shadow is going to be. And then I'm going with this value. Obviously, I wouldn't use this value down there because it's up where it's lighter. So I'm using this darker purple again to kind of scumble. A little harder because I'm working with the, the warpy paper. And I'm going to soften that, that warmth up down there that I just added. Maybe add a little more of that blue in places. Okay, so now we've got a nice little underpainting, a value kind of study in a way. We've got pretty much our lightest lights going on. We know that the other lightest lights are gonna be these pairs. If you wanted to you know, make a middle note. I am going to look at the reference picture now. Um, if you want to make a middle note of where they are, 
I mean, you could go ahead and make a little mark if you wanted. This is where the lightest light is on this pair. I'm gonna make it real light because I am gonna add some greens to this. This is where the lightest light is on this pair. We've got a little, um, almost like a little crease or crevice there. And then there's another light light back there. It's not gonna be that light. Um, and then we've got a little highlight on this pair right here. Let's see, where is it? Yeah, right here. It's kind of like a little, almost like a long rectangular shape there. And let me squint. That's a good way to, to get where your highlights are. Now we're gonna have some highlights too hitting here, here. Oh, there is a little one like right there. This pastel is so chunky, it's hard to make a mark. Um, but these highlights that we're seeing, some of these even over here, are not gonna be as light. These are like those little bright ones that I just added. They're gonna be kind of like your your lightest, um, more of a yellowy value. Um, but what I'm gonna do before I add those, you know, we typically work dark to light. Well, I'm gonna do that in these pairs as well, after I get a sip of coffee. <laughs> after getting up, I thought, you know, maybe I will play around a little bit with the blending of this sky so the texture isn't competing as much with the pairs. So I have this little piece of pipe foam insulation. I'm trying to find a clean spot where I can just blend a little bit. Yeah, I do like that. All I'm doing is I'm blending, um, well, blending kind of down. What I want to do is work with the, the upper part kind of first, because it's all of the darker values, and then just gradually work my way down. Yeah, see that, how it softens it? And that way your attention isn't focused on it quite as much as um, it was before. And I'm gonna even soften that little edge of the, um, the tabletop so I don't have such a stark line. So um, all I'm gonna do is make little, I'll just blend it together a little bit so it's not such a division kind of softens it up. You can even blend a little bit of the upper tablecloth or tablecloth table, whatever it is, back there because often things will um, be a little bit out of focus further away, like that back part of the table, and then they start to get more in focus as they move forward. So just a little bit of blending in here. Creates that illusion of these pairs really being three-dimensional. That's how our eyes work. You know, we don't, uh, photographs often um, represent things not like we see them with our eyes because our eyes, because we only focus on a few things at a time uh, and not the whole scene. Um, for example, if you're looking at a pencil in front of you in your hand, you're not, you're not focusing on or seeing maybe um, things in the background in your kitchen or whatever, you know? So um, we often need to recreate that in art with that illusion of how our eyes work rather than what the photograph really shows. All right, so that did help. I do like that. I'm going to now add some of the highlights that are in, or the shadowy, not highlights, the shadowy areas that are in the pairs. I'm thinking this is a blue that I pulled out I apologize, I haven't been real good at putting these down. Let me go ahead and do that. Um, let's see, I'm gonna go with my darkest darks here. That was that dark maroon kind of color. And um, then I had this purpley color. I can't remember if I added this blue, but I'm probably going to add it. It's kind of a gray blue, I like that color. So those were like my darkest darks. I did have this little new pastel that is a dark and it's pretty dark. I'll put it up here. It looks almost black, but that's what I used underneath these hair shadows. And uh, then uh, this is the blue that I might be adding. I need a little bit lighter for these pairs. That's gonna be a little dark. See how dark that was? So I'm probably gonna grab a lighter blue. I, I could use this blue and I may for some of the pear shadows. Um, let's see here, and shadows, um, are usually cooler, so that's why often I use blues and purples. But because there's so much blue and purple in the tabletop, I may get a little creative with some of the shadows. This is a new pastel 
that I'm not sure if I'll use. It's kind of a brown or a, 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 a dark sepia, something like that. All right, so now here are some of the, uh, let, me, let me go ahead and go down with these blues right here. This is that one that I had uh, in the sky. Uh, this one was another one that I had on this tabletop back here. It's more of that lavender. And then these were the, the lighter highlights that I used. This is more of the blue one. This is a little bit brighter than that one. Still has some blue in it. And this was the yellow one. They don't even show up that much. But you see how this one's definitely lighter. You see it more on that paper. Okay, so those were like my light lights. And um, now I'll try to start sharing the other colors as I go along. Oh, I don't think I got this purple. This little purple. And this little purple. It's This is the pinkish purple one that I used. Okay. So that's pretty much what I used so far. I'm pretty sure. In an effort to speed this video up a bit in order to speed up the uploading time, some of you may know where I live, I have really slow Wi-Fi, and uh, to upload a video more than an hour takes a while. Because I've done a lot of talking and instruction, it's uh, caused my painting time to take a lot longer than I normally would. So I'm speeding the rest of this up because I, I think you guys probably got the uh, the best information about how to do an underpainting uh, or watercolor underpainting underneath pastel. So uh, enjoy the rest of this. Again, sped up a bit, but I am going to do a little bit of voiceover here to explain what's happening. I'm using cooler shadows like the blues and the teals in the uh, side where the light is not shining. And the reason I'm doing that is I know these uh, pairs are greenish yellow and I didn't really want to use any dark purples or you know color or dark dark blues for the shadows I wanted to keep them alive with color this is kind of a colorist approach I guess you could say also too uh, right there what I'm doing is um, I'm kind of changing the shape of a couple of the pairs. That's the wonderful thing is that we really have more flexibility with pastels than a lot of people think. I didn't like uh, how the one pair up top was leaning a little bit more to the right. I wanted it more to the left. I liked that gestural quality better. I also mentioned about not having things just too close. It's better to have it overlapping um, or far farther apart than touching. And later I decide I, that bottom pair there is almost touching that top pair, uh, the one on the left, and I didn't feel that looked right compositionally, so I decided to uh, overlap it. I make the bottom pair bigger, which makes sense. It would have been larger anyway in the foreground. Um, now I'm just using some different greens. Darker greens go more in the shadow, and then I am gradually get them lighter. I'm showing there how I also didn't really like how those were kind of lined up at the bottom, so I... I actually made that pair a little bit larger. Isn't it great that with pastel, um, you really, when you use a good paper like you are, you have so much layering ability that you can correct things as you work. And if you have, by chance, lost all your layering ability, then um, you can also um, brush off pastel and kind of start over. You know, you just get a kind of a bristle brush and start over. Um, now, in hindsight, I, I may have left... Uh, more of that blue. Uh, I actually got up and down a lot during this painting. Just, you know, life is just crazy. Um, there's a lot going on right now. Uh, but anyway, um, I didn't end up leaving a lot of the watercolor showing through, but I think I'd like to uh, try it again, not with this, these pairs, but with something else, and uh, leave a bit more of the watercolor showing through. But I do, I love watercolor underpaintings because I feel like you can really just get a nice composition in to start with and kind of get an idea of your values and uh, and I happen to love watercolor by the way uh, I've been realizing that there are so many people right now that are a little bit bored at home you know we artists uh, don't really have a problem with that if we've got some art supplies at home but there's a lot of people who don't have anything like that at home and now the shops are closed or you can't leave and uh, you're limited in what you can purchase so I decide, you can see now there too, I'm adding some of the, those pairs have some orangey tints to them uh, as well. But um, I decided that one of the best or easiest mediums to teach for someone who doesn't have a lot of art supplies is watercolor. 
a lot of times people, especially if you have, have kids, you probably have one of the little uh, basic palettes of watercolor um, at home, hopefully. And uh, if not, you know, you can get them at places like Walmart. And uh, I thought for in an effort to help give people something to do and some art to learn. A lot of people love art. You know, that's why those sketch and sip things are so popular. People want to learn how to paint. Um, so I thought I would do some very simple watercolor lessons, showing a little bit about color mixing and about watercolor uh, techniques. Super basic, super simple, um, and hopefully just about anybody could participate in that. I thought that'd be a lot of fun. And then end each little episode of learning with a very simple little watercolor painting that someone could feel like, look what I did. Um, so, you know, I hope this thing doesn't go on much longer, <laughs> but in case it does, I thought that would be a neat way to kind of give back to the community and provide something of value. So, you know, you guys let me know if you think that would be good. You guys might even like that. I know a lot of people who are uh, in Monet Cafe and on my Patreon page, you may not have experience with watercolor and it really is a great way to combine pastels, you know, the, the mixed media of watercolor and pastels. And by the way, I am going to be doing a gouache underpainting very soon. I'm not sure if it'll be the next um, session of this 12 Days of Healing, but uh, it will be pretty soon. Maybe I will do that. I don't know. Watercolor and gouache is a little similar, but I'll, I'll explain the differences um, when I get to that. I did want to describe, I don't think I finished, I had been talking about um, the inherent advantages of watercolor is its luminosity, how you just get that glow, the paper showing through, things seem uh, uh, bright because of the translucency um, inherent to watercolor. Uh, and I was going to share, uh, in comparison to pastels, which are opaque, that don't have that uh, natural luminosity with the paper. In other words, when you put pastel down, I mean, unless you have a super light approach, the pastel in general um, makes a um, solid application rather than a transparent application. Uh, sorry for my shirt there. And, um, but what is, I'm gonna compare the two of these at the very end, and I think you'll be able to easily see what is the quality that pastels has perhaps over watercolor. And, you know, I don't think this goes on much longer, so I'll go ahead and share. Notice when I get to the end and I show the watercolor, uh, and I, the watercolor painting that I did, I actually did it last night, was real simple. I actually did it kind of while cooking dinner. If that sounds crazy, it, you know, <laughs> it is kind of crazy, but, um, but anyway, it's very simple and basic. So I could, um, I could have done more to give the watercolor more vibrancy. But on that note, that's what pastels has over watercolor. The color vibrancy, that bold, brilliant. I think that's what I love about pastels so much is that you can get such gorgeous um, saturation of color. Now I know that I've seen watercolor artists that really do an amazing job with that, but it's not really something that is inherent about watercolors versus pastels. So that's a little bit of the difference in some of the things that I see um, with watercolor and pastel. I wanted to warm up that background a little bit. I knew there was some light um, perhaps from the source of the sun back there. So that's why I gave it a little bit of that pink. Um, and then I added a little bit of that in the pairs as well. So these are kind of uh, very colorful pairs, definitely. But I really enjoyed painting them, even though I took a little longer than I had planned. And, you know, I was going to do these in about 15 minutes or less. But you know what? The point of this is art therapy. So if you've got the time, paint. Now, who cares if it takes three hours, you know, if you've got the time and it's relaxing you're, and you're enjoying it. All right, guys, I hope you enjoyed this. I hope you learned something. Comment, please. Share if you'd like. I mean, if you're on Monet Cafe, I am providing this one gratis to Monet Cafe, even though these are normally on my Patreon page. Feel free to share these and join along. And if you are one of my patrons, also, please, if you do this session, you can use your own fruit. I, I would like it if you did something similar to the subject matter. Um, use whatever reference photo or the one I provided, and please share it in the Google Photo Album. Uh, you guys know if you're my patrons how to get to that and share it. So anyway, guys, happy painting. Be blessed. I pray everyone is safe. Stay protected. And I'll be back with session four tomorrow.